Hello, beautiful people. Today we are with Professor Gustavo Dantas. So let me do a quick presentation. Professor Gustavo Dantas is a fifth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with more than 20 years of coaching experience and being a world class competitor, achieving three world titles in his career. Professor Dantas is also a owner of Gustavo Dantas Jiu Jitsu Academy president of the Arizona State Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu League and event promoter. Gustavo is also a public speaker as well a certificated high performance mental life coach with a bachelor degree in physical education. He is also hosted in two podcasts, the BJJ Mental Coach and Mental Blindada 24-7. Professor Dantas is also author of several books. The last one is Seven Lessons from Seven Champions. To end the presentation, he is also a founder of the nonprofit organization Jiu-Jitsu Tribe, who offers free Jiu-Jitsu class to privileged children and young adults in poor communities in Brazil. Hello, Professor, how are you? Did I forget something? And now it's all good. I'm doing great, man. It's every day with all the madness that's going on. It's a 1% better every day. That is perfect. Oh, that is a great question. I, I, I will call it with Kaizam uh, methodology. Can you just to do, do, I think it's, it's a nice principle. How, how do you think about it? one percent better every day can you give a little bit more in that just to start it easy on yeah this is a especially at this moment right now everything is just slowly improvement but i feel that any type since i was able to compete in jiu-jitsu and be around high performers in high performance you just don't go from 30 percent to 80 from nine a day or to 90 percent it, it's not like that. So it's like, okay, 30%, nice. Okay, now you 30.5 and now you 31, now we're 32. It, you look at, into even high level Olympic athletes, they don't, they don't improve like that. Oh, today I'm 50%, oh, tomorrow I'm 70%. It's not like that, it's slow and steady as long as you're moving. And I was talking with my wife this week but she was of course everyone got hit hard every business got hit hard so if we focus on what we don't have and then you'll be depressed you know one gonna move a massive anxiety so i just been pushing on her the, this mindset especially now one percent better every day and visualizing this so i was very happy that two days ago she was like one percent better like right like yeah you know every day someone's coming back Maybe this is a new student and, and that's how it is. So that's when the, the martial arts competitions, let's put it this way, gave me that, gave me this, this experience to understand that things don't just boom from nine a day. It's slow and steady. As long as we're moving forward, we're progressing. That's all we can do. Perfect. Professor, now let's go for me, like starting really deep, a little bit back for the, the listeners that still don't know you. Can you tell me a little bit about you, what you do, what is your work, please? Yeah, so it's, it's even tough to say what I do because I, I think I do many things, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> my, my whole life is surrounded Jiu Jitsu. Uh, but the main thing we're going to talk maybe a little a little deeper in the conversation about the importance of living congruence with what you believe in congruence with your values so everything that i work during my life it's aligned with the same thing or the same purpose of inspiring impact and improve people's lives if it's not related to that i won't mess with it there's nothing wrong with it. i just i just don't want to there's something that is not aligned so that means we have a jiu-jitsu school so yeah we are inspiring, impact, and improving people's lives in some way. Promoting tournaments, I'm a big fan of jiu-jitsu tournaments as a personal development tool. So yes, we're inspiring, impact, and improving. Mental coaching, life coaching, high performance coaching for entrepreneurs. As you already mentioned, the jiu-jitsu tribe, the nonprofit organization, everything is aligned with the same thing. So if it's not aligned with that, even for money, it doesn't attract me. 
you know, I'm, I'm not that I'm a millionaire by, by any means, but I think everyone needs to live in congruence with your values. And my number one value is freedom of choice. I just wanted to work. My goal wasn't like to make tons of money. My, my goal was to, when I was younger, I just want to do whatever I feel like I want to do. It was always like that. Absolutely not. Because in many, many phases of our journey, we have to do some jobs that are like, eh, I wish I wasn't doing this job, but it is what it is. But as long as you have a, a different goal in mind that hey, I have, yeah, I've done a lot of, and you can talk more about this, a lot of different jobs when I came to the United States. And eventually it got to a point that since 2005, I only work with what I want to or only work with people that I want to. So it, it was hard to get to the point but now, so has been since 2005. Well, perfect. And that will, I think it's amazing. And that will come to, to the next question. That is, how, uh, how did you find your purpose? Because you also talk a lot in your, your podcast that I'm a big fan, uh, the BJJ Mental Coach, about finding your purpose. How did you find your purpose, Professor? I think when you start the personal development journey of like learning, so I've been, I got involved with personal development. I start crawling, let's put this way, in 2008. So that's when I start to get a little bit more introduced to self-awareness, to understand myself better. And that means going to seminars, going to retreats, therapies, all kinds of different stuff that little by little you get to understand yourself better. And I started to, because I think one way to figure it out too is like, if you don't know what you want to do or your purpose, well, start with what you don't want to do. Make a list like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to work on this and that. Good. Okay. Eliminate that. And little by little, you, uh, you start working towards what you want. So I feel that I was, I think I was very blessed that when I was very young, I didn't know that I was doing that, that I discovered my number one value, which is freedom of choice. And with that, I think it just led me to my purpose because I'm like, you know, I was probably, I, I don't know, somewhere around 12, I was in a difficult moment in, in my life with, with my mom. It was with a, with a person that was very abusive. And I just figured out that I don't want people telling me what to do. And I just put that in my mind and I kind of was like the rebel of the family in, in a way, you know, because it's like, what do you mean you're going to the United States? You don't even have a job. I'm like, okay. But, uh, and then years later I became the entrepreneur of the year for the family. You know what I mean? But, <laughs> but that's how it is. It's all good. Perfect. I think that you already answered to my next question that it will be which advice that you will give to the people that, uh, don't know what to the purpose I think like start for what you don't like I think it's a really good advice professor we can say now in my opinion um, what if I find my purpose and I'm too afraid to risk because like you said it you are going for not the common uh, uh, way what which advice you will give it to me I feel that sometimes people just get, uh, how can I say, just frozen by fear. But when you start to think about fear of what exactly, you know, because you got to remember whether if you're listening right now, I don't, it doesn't matter what, what part of the world you live into, whether you like or you don't, let me give you the news. One day you're going to die. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so when at, you don't want to just wait until the end, until you say, you know, there's, there's a book called The Five Regrets of Dying by Bronnie, Aware, uh, Bronnie Ware. She's an Australian nurse. She worked with uh, patients with like maybe three months to live, with cancer patients. And then she started to collect their regrets of people when they realize that, oh my God, you know, I'm dying. And the number one was, I wish I had the courage to pursue what I want, not what others expected of me, you know? And I think a lot of people 
have this kind of fear or worry that, but what if I do? And what others gonna think if I don't get it? I don't wanna disappoint my parents. I don't wanna disappoint whoever. And at the end of life, and that's the number one that people realize, oh my God, all these years, and I was so worried for what? You know, and I think I always had that in mind and, and messages like that just make you give an extra push to like, man, I need to get the ball rolling here. I need to go. And, and again, I don't, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with jiu-jitsu or everyone trains, but that's big lessons of jiu-jitsu that you don't get the outcome that you want every time you want and in the moment that you want. Things not always happen like that. And that's in jiu-jitsu, that's in life. You know, so you, during the journey, yeah, things are going to happen. that will be like, that did not go your way and not always going to go your way, but it's just what you do with this experience, how you move forward, you know? And the thing is everyone, uh, sometimes you have, you have a goal and imagine that goal is on the top of a mountain. And a lot of people just stay in the bottom of the mountain, just looking up. It's like, dude, that thing is so high. It's so far. I not even know how to get there, how to start. I'm not even going to start. You know, so the point is just to start climbing. When you're going to get there, I have no idea. I have no idea. That's each one's journey. And you're going to go up and then something's going to happen and you slide down. And you go this way here. Ooh, it's close right here. I need to come down. I need to go up again. And you just keep going. And then when you get to the top of the mountain down, that's each one. Uh, let's say let's say i reach the top of the mountain let's say like some of the goals that i accomplish and i just look up huh nice okay now time to start climbing another one you know and then and then you go and then you try and that's going to be the same thing the same growing pains the same uh let's say disappointments the same happy moments it's literally that that journey you know that's that's all you know, so I think people need to understand too, they, they need to reflect what exactly are they afraid of? You know, what is that, is that disappointing or what exactly that is? Yeah, I think it's a perfect question because sometimes it's that, what, what, what if somebody don't, and let me say you were, and I want that you to know this, you were a big inspire for me to start this project because of the words that you say in your podcast. If you want, you, you have to do it. You just no one's going to do it time. for you. Exactly. And we just live one time. Yeah. I'm going to share something real quick with you that Thank you. Thank you. I had opportunity to, to be certified with as a high performance coach with Brandon Burchard. I don't know how many people are familiar with him, but it's a well-known high performance coach. And I think maybe, I think I went through the course in 2016 and man, it helped me out a lot. A lot of things, you know, at this, the same material that, uh, when I coach high performers, uh, high performers, that's the same process that I, that I teach. And I believe because I went through with myself and that's how I share my stuff. Like I want to make sure that I'm going through, I believe in the, in the whatever product that is, and then I can share it with people. But Brendan says something really interesting and that I use this and I highly recommend people to investigate that too, which is the human being, it's usually have, there's, fear three types of pains, generally speaking, three types of pain, the, the, the process pain, uh, uh, the, the loss uh, pain, the process pain, and the outcome pain. I'm going to talk about each one. So, for example, I'm going to give uh, just a regular example of someone that is in a, in a job that they're not happy you know, like, dude, I don't like this. I go in every day, like, this is miserable. And, and they think about a possibility of changing jobs or possibly starting a business. And then they go like, man, I'm gonna try this new job, but what if I do this, this thing and does it work? What my family gonna think about it? What about the, the grass is not green and on the other side? You know what? I think, I think I'm gonna stay here because it's safer. I just mentioned the three pains right now because the, the pain uh, of the, the loss pain, the loss is, is not just loss of money. It's loss that too, but loss of self-esteem, loss of respect. What people are going to think of me if I 
go, yeah, I try this and everyone knows and I don't get it. Or maybe I'm going to lose my, I have benefits for my health and uh, uh, health plans or whatever. And then they cut that. Now I don't have that. So there's some type of like fear of uh, some type of uh, loss. And then there's the process pain, which is, man, what if I go all through this, you know, like this long process and, and I get to the other side, the outcome, and it's not what I expected. So you're afraid of the loss of the process and the outcome. And you can control none of that. So when you think about a loss, you got to really think about this and what exactly you're afraid of losing. And there's always, a, everything you do, there's a risk, you know? And Jim Rome says something really cool to say, like, life is so risky that at the end, you don't live it alive. You know what I mean? You're going to die. Is that risk? You know what I mean? <laughs> there's, there's no other way around. Um, the second one, the process, the process is for real. The process is hard. You know, like, oh, that process is, the process pain is legit. And the outcome that you don't know. So I'm going to give you a, a practical example of how I personally use this in, mm, I don't know, maybe 2015. I can't remember exactly when, many years ago. So I was um, I was competing in jiu-jitsu and I was doing well in a, in a master's division and you know right now I'm 46 but I think it was maybe 39 or 40 and I decided you know what I man I, I wanted to compete as an adult again and be able to compete at the at the, a world, the world championship as an adult and you need to get points for the and by, back then IBJJF was including the the point system so I just finished winning a, uh, one of the bigger tournaments here in the U.S. And I'm like, you know what? I started looking, look at the calendar. And I saw that there was a tournament in Long Beach called Long Beach International Open. And the timing, since I do so many things, I'm not like in competing in time. I need, to, I need to have a nice window that I can, because something's got to give. I cannot do everything I do and expect to go 100% of my preparation. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really work, at least for me, it doesn't work like that. So I start to get information and I started looking and suddenly just hit me some anxiety, just started like hitting me hard. And I'm like, wait a minute, why? So right away, that's my tip for you guys, investigate why this anxiety is in your chest. I can do one thing, I can uh, close the computer down and go like this too. <sighs> okay, the anxiety is gone, you know, oh, or you can, you know what, let me investigate here. Why am I feeling this way? What am I afraid of? What kind of pain am I afraid of? The, uh, the loss pain, the process pain, the outcome pain. So I started thinking, I was like, man, so my negative, uh, my negative voice, my dark passenger, the, the voice that bring all the error, the fears and the anxiety, doubts and securities, start throwing like, Gustavo, what are you doing, man? You're 40 years old. What are you going to try to do against those 20 year olds? So you're going to embarrass yourself. You're going to lose. You're going to do all this for nothing. You know, so again, all three were there, you know, and then I caught myself with that. And, and I said, you know what, screw it. I just pick up my, my credit card and I sign up at the spot feeling the anxiety, by the way, the anxiety wasn't gone. It was here on my chest and I could feel it. And I'm like, I'm going to do it. Just got my card, do, 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 sign up. I'm like, all right, it's official. You know, uh, I'm signed up. And I had about five or six weeks to prepare. So since I understand that I'm a, I was a 40-year-old competing in a, in a high level, I just knew that the process for me would have to be very, very intense because I need to make sure that my diet is on point. I've never been so focused with my diet before because I knew it, like, I cannot relax. I cannot give anything, like, I had, a, you know, conditioning training, I cannot miss, class. I did everything I could, and the end, when you do everything you could to be ready for any task, whatever, if it's a tournament or not, your confidence goes up. So I went really well prepared, and I was able to win the tournament, which was really cool, and with that, I started to get points, and I was able to compete at the Worlds in the, the following year. So the point that I'm trying to make here it's not that I look at me and try to brag that, oh, wow, uh, I want this and that. It's not about that. It's about that when you do have that voice coming in your head that's going to question you, you don't have to accept this voice. Like, oh, yeah, what are you going to do? You're going to embarrass yourself, and then you're going to tell, like, yeah, that's true. I'm gonna no, 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 no. You need to clash with this voice and to question that because 
I feel like it's like that snowball coming downhill. It goes like to do, to do, and it gets momentum. It's like the negative thoughts. If you don't stop that, it keeps getting bigger, gets more speed. Next thing, anxiety attack, and you're frozen. You're not going to do what you want to do because of fear. And I do my best not to allow fear. Um, I got something that I saw Will Smith talking about this once, that anytime I feel that I'm afraid of something, that's my trigger to say, like, do it do it and that's my tip for all the listeners when you feel that anxiety investigate and see like is it my life in danger you know can i really die with this because that's number one your safety can i go like okay i may get submitted i can get choked out but I, I, odds of me dying in a tournament are very very slim you know so if it's just a psychological fear man Let's do it. And that's basically what I suggest to people investigate what kind of fear is holding you back. And be now that you are aware, you do whatever you want with that. Because when you're not aware, it's okay. Like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that I was aware. I closed the computer. Okay, I'm not gonna do it. But when you know the responsibility is on you, no one, you're the only one who knows. It's like this. Imagine we just uh we just had a had this conversation and then now someone's listening that listen to podcast sharing with someone said so like hey i saw this guy gustavo who was uh man really cool really inspiring and you're driving and then your your friend is in, uh, in the passenger seat and then he tells you hey just just to let you know the emergency brake it's on and then you're like oh no problem so anyway great podcast I'm like dude but if you release that we can go can get faster to the destination, safer, without damaging the car. Yeah, no worry, man, no problem. So anyway, great podcast. So the person is aware there's an issue. Now it's up to them to address or not. So if you don't want to address, you, now you don't have the right to complain, period. You know what I mean? You're aware and you're choosing not to aware so to, to do something about it. So that's the same thing with the fear. You are aware. Now you understand where the fear is coming from. Now it's up to you if you want to, you're going to proceed or not. If you're not, you're just not allowed to complain. You know what I mean? Perfect. And I think it's perfect. Now going, I think uh, a question comes to my mind now. How, um, how can we check? Like I'm feeling, feeling, I will say, for example, let's put jujitsu in the table. I'm going to compete and I feel anxiety with the competition or I feel anxiety with a new job, let's say, how can I check it, the origin of the fear, like you were saying, which kind of process do you use? Well, this comes down to emotional intelligence, right? And the number, the number one pillar is self-awareness, and the number two is the self-regulation that I just mentioned right now. First, you're aware of it. Oh, we have a problem. So, second, you address it or not. So I feel that this is, you have to reflect and ask yourself and be honest with yourself, brutally honest with yourself. What exactly is the fear? And if you feel that you need to talk with someone about it, you need professional help, and then you do it. I personally look for professional help. I would not be able to have this conversation with you 10 years ago, fact. You know what I mean? Just many years of studying and reading and uh, retreats and seminars and so many things that gives me, gives me more tools to deal with this and just become even more. So first you have to be honest with yourself mm -hmm. to know that, okay, uh, that when you start to ask and reflect, like what exactly is because why I do not want to sign up for this tournament why I do not want to really uh, change uh, or change jobs or whatever so you have to investigate that and sometimes you'll be able to find it and be like oh wow I'm afraid I don't want to disappoint my parents because if I do they're going to think they expect me to do that and then now is the point I mean do you want that to determine if you're going to do something or not you know, that's their opinion. Les Brown has a great saying that someone's opinion of you don't have to become your reality. So that's their opinion, that's their deal. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to worry about it. And if you do, 
I think people were very worried about asking for help, professional help. You know, mm -hmm. I started, and we're going to talk a little bit more how I got involved deeper into the mental coaching is because I wanted answers and I couldn't figure it out. And I said, why I'm feeling anxious? Why do I have anxiety? I want to figure it out, you know? And then um, that started to make more sense to me. And then I started to work on it. Again, I became aware and then I chose. And that's the thing that the listener, and if you listen right now, you have to choose. No one's going to choose for you if you want to take action or not. You know, you can go to seminars. I know plenty of people that invest a lot of money, seminars and, and retreats and coaching, but they don't do anything with that. I heard a guy saying that it was like, I don't know if it's a proper politically right term to say, but mental masturbation. You know, you just in your mind, you just do, but you're not doing anything. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's, that's what you're doing with your knowledge. You're just getting all this excitement, all this, but nothing is really happening. You know, exactly. so that's up to each one. Exactly. And you also talk about in your podcast that uh, the, the, the difference be, between the warrior of the mind and the library of the mind. I think it's the perfect definition because nowadays it's really easy to get the information, but applying the information that you get, that is the, 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 the difficult step. Yeah, that's the typical uh, talk from the uh, stoicism. You know, you see like a lot of stuff like that. And yeah, people just gathering information and over and over. And it's cool, but and people get so addicted to adding information but the idea of the warrior of the mind that's the guy that is in the arena the arena of life testing it out and that's basically what a what i had to do when a, i'm just going to mention a little bit how i got involved with the mental coaching please just long story short i went through my jiu-jitsu journey i had a roller coaster of confidence i think this is not just jiu-jitsu people in general there are moments that you're more confident in your life sometimes things happen you confidence goes down and in sports is the same way and I went from having zero confidence probably like negative because I couldn't beat anyone and then to start to grow kind of peak and then move to the U.S. kind of crush all the way down for whatever uh, reasons I had and to be honest lack of emotional maturity and not knowing how to deal with my dark passenger and when I got back to competing around 2007, and that's kind of my spark to start studying, because I started competing again. I, I took like a four-year break, and I felt that I was feeling a lot of anxiety when I was competing the night before. The day. It's normal to have the little butterflies, but I felt that, man, I'd, I'm not competing. I'm not performing the way I do in the academy. That's the main thing that I that I... I could tell, I know, you know yourself better when you're performing your best in whatever the, mm -hmm. the area is. And I end up, and I competed in a tournament and I end up winning myself, but I didn't like my performance as far as how I felt. I was very anxious because I had a lot of students with me. So now I'm worried about, I'm saying this right now, but I didn't know back then. But now I'm concerned that I have 30 students with me. They like all the, the professors going to compete or whatever, you know, so now I'm bringing this, I'm pressuring myself, no one's pressuring me, you know, most of the time we're just pressuring ourselves, we create our own crazy stories, and I just got home, I remember like it was today, man, I just got in a hotel in Vegas, and I was like, I need to get to the bottom of this, I'm sick of this, of feeling this anxiety and not knowing how to deal with it, so I went to Google, and I put mental preparation for jiu-jitsu, and of course, nothing came up, and I started to research, and then I found one small program was just a little uh, little printout, little booklet with a little CD. I, I think it was a, the Fearless Athlete. I can't remember. It was very simple, but that was enough just to give me a spark of like, wait a minute. Wow, I have a lot more mental blocks than I imagined. I, a lot of things that I never really, and start playing a movie in my, in my head, like, oh my God, all these years, you know? So... That was the moment that I could, what, be the warrior of the mind. I could be the librarian. Cool. Again, I can just keep adding and reading books and doing whatever. So I chose to 
start studying more, doing the life coach and, and mental coach, but competing at the same time because I wanted to test drive what I was doing. So I did that for about two years. And the cool thing is that I started to improve, but it's not like, because I did have results before. It's not like I wasn't having results, but it's more about feeling, about how mm -hmm. am I feeling? Am I happy? Am I relaxed? Or am I like anxious, you know? And, and I started noticing the difference. I started having more that internal peace that winning or losing, I'm like, I'm good. I can't. It was me. The guy won. Okay, no problem. So I did that for two years, and I noticed the difference not only on the mats, but especially off the mats. I started to kind of locate maybe some of the projects that I want to do, or maybe I was afraid, and I didn't even know why I was afraid. And then again, I started to understand that, start sharing with my students, because I, I think everyone that trains jiu-jitsu is, is listening, maybe have competed before, maybe have seen someone in the academy that they train really well but when they get to the competition they end up not performing because of anxiety competition anxiety and i started noticing that i'm like man this guy is a freaking animal here in an academy how come he's not uh, doing well so i started to talk with each one and i started noticing the difference again on and off the mat and after that i decided well i cannot really sit here and talk with every single person it's just not doable and I announced at a class and I said, hey, this Saturday, I'm going to do a mental coaching class. I'm just going to share what I've learned for the past. That was about, by that time, about two and a half years. And no expectations, not like I was charging anyone. It's just like, hey, whoever wants to come here and talk about it, I'm just going to share what is working for me. And 40 people showed up. So that was, that was good because people to see that, it, you know, if you listen to this at home and you do struggle with anxiety, let me tell you this, you're not alone. You're not the only one. There's like billions or whatever, how many people, you know, uh, that have the same difficulties, you know? And, and I did for like three, four more times. And, and I decided, you know what? I think I want to, I want to open this to the Jiu Jitsu community in my state. So I did my first professional public speaking um, engagement uh, and it was uh, it went great and from there like ah, I don't want to I want to share the message but I don't want to keep traveling every weekend or doing seminars so back then so I think this was 2014 maybe and then I created my first back then it was a DVD program and now it's a online program of the inner discovery for outer success and and the words started to go on out, start helping people from all over the world and a high level competitor started to contact me for, uh, to help them with them to be a mental coach. And then basically how everything, the word got out, you know, and, and people say like, oh, that I'm the pioneer of that in jujitsu. I'm like, I don't know if I'm the, I think they're like, for sure, there are many people who are doing that way before me. I just went public as far as putting myself out there and, did I have people saying like, of course, they're always haters, everything you do. So if you focus on haters, you're not going to do anything. And then people are like, oh, that's a bunch of bull crap. You know, my, my old days, we just train hard. Good for you. But it's not for everyone. You know what I mean? I wish I could say that, I, that I never lost. I'm tough. Or like, no, man, I had fear, anxiety. I didn't know how to deal with it, you know? And, but the reality is, and you know how uh, Brazilians are. If they if they say have something to say, they will say and they'll criticize it and they like they will kill you online. You know what I mean? And they like, <laughs> man, they're brutal. So I had like massive positive uh, response. I mean, it was rare to have like negative because I'm just being real and I'm not trying to convince anyone for anything. It's just like yo, this is what worked for me. Maybe it worked for you. I don't know. That's that's the only thing. And and now that's where we're at right now. I'm getting back to the Brazilian market, which has been cool. I've been meaning to do that for a long time since I've focused on the uh, English for a long time. So I'm excited for this new phase. You know, I think I struggle with time before of doing everything I wanted. So the quarantine, I think it was good for that. You know, so I could have focused on something else. But I think what comes down to, again, me sharing the story of all of that is not always, I mentioned this, that it is not in the intention of look how many things I do. It's just to convey to you that 
if you want to make progress in your life, you need to face your demons. You gotta figure out what is happening and take action. It's not action for a week or a month. As Les Brown say, until, until when, I don't know, it's, it's, it's your dream, it's your goal, until you, you believe that it's necessary. And, and that's the, the message that I just try to pass to people like, hey man, you do whatever you want with this information. This is what helped me help other people around the world and maybe can help you, maybe it doesn't. Maybe can maybe it won't help, but this I believe from being so blessed to work with like so many high level athletes that trust me to like maybe help a tiny bit with uh, with their journey, you know? Because I mean it's a team that make a champion. Who have the teacher? Who have the the nutritionist? Who have you know? So and so I'm just giving my two cents, and I'm glad that I'm able to help some people not to win but just to get internal peace, to be like, you know what, that was me. That's it, that's, that's all I ask of people. However, let's be honest, there's nothing better than internal peace with a gold medal, you know what I mean? That's incredible when you can get the two, like, wow, I felt great and I won, great. So that's the main thing that I'm looking for with people, just to help them to get this, um, this internal peace. Perfect, professor. And I wanted also, if you can, it, um, can you describe a little bit more what is the work that you do with the athletes, uh, the mental coach, what kind of preparation do you do? Yeah, we do, do you have an assessment to figure it out? So I have an idea of some of the difficulties they have. So I have, so it's a little, uh, each one, it, it's probably like a 25 minute to like a 30 minute like assessment that people go through and I, and I go in and analyze. And based on that, I start to kind of attack some of, the, some of the issues that they might be facing. And for them, and a lot of the times it's just questions. I'm just asking questions to be like, I'm nervous because of like, but why? Oh, because of big term and why? And then what's gonna happen if you don't win? And like, well, like, and then it starts seeing like, yeah, my life will continue. Exactly. You know what I mean? So we always make this big chaos and this big thing when things are not going to work the way we want. And little by little, they start to realize that, yeah, it's, it's not that, uh, it's not that bad if it, I don't get the outcome that I want. Of, of course. So everyone that works with, with me in some way, I always mention and I, and I just said, um, my goal, it's not to help people. Of course, it's becoming a champion is, is just the, it's just consequence of your work. But again, my main work with them, I always say, I give my seminars and say, like, if you came here for me to give you the, the gold medal, we're in the wrong room, you know, because it's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about internal peace of being the best version of yourself inside like on the mat and outside of the mat you know and that's all we ask for you know to be strive i don't think maybe we i don't know never going to be the level 100 of max the best every day but definitely going to be pushing that bar as high as we can so that's my main thing is help you to become help you during the process of becoming the best so you were saying about uh, the athlete become the best version of yourself. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, and that's the main goal because, again, I'm not trying to promise medals. I'm not trying to promise titles or promise people's business going to go well. It's just have the internal peace, be at peace that you literally trying the best you can with the tools and knowledge you have right now. Maybe next week you have more tools or have more knowledge, but right now, this is all you have and you're gonna do the best you can with what you have right now. So the intention on and off the mat is to become the best version of yourself. And my job is to help with that process, even if I can help a little bit to give a little push. So it's great. And there's people that I see transformations that are incredible and there's people that I have worked in, and this is hard because I had to fire clients before, you know, because if I'm serious, if I have a 12-session a program, okay, that I believe that, that it works, not that I create it, that I follow, 
if by like week four or five and you're not doing the homework, let's say, you're not doing a part every time like, oh yeah, yeah. And then it got to a point like, I don't think, I think you're wasting your time and wasting my time. Because the intention is uh, get to be the best version of yourself, but seems like you're not committed with becoming the best version of yourself. If, if the person is not committed, what am I gonna do? You know, like it doesn't matter if you, you hire the most famous coach ever. If you're not gonna tell what the coach is telling, what is the point? It's like the same in jujitsu. The guy's gonna show you the moves and you're like, eh, I don't wanna do it. Nah, don't gonna do I'm just gonna I'm gonna do my own thing anyway. Like what what are you doing here then? You know, so uh, I feel that the, the person needs to be committed to the change, you know, and no one's going to do it for you. No one's going to accomplish your goal for you. No one. It's your goal. It's your dream. It's your issues, your problems to solve, not anyone else. You know, people are going to help you along the way if you're not only, and I always mention that, not only interested, but rather committed to that. Because when people are interested, they do what is convenient when they're, uh, when they're interested. When they're committed, they do what they need, they need to do to get accomplished, whether you like or you don't do i every day i'm blessed that i can work with things that i enjoy but do i do things that i love every minute no there are parts of the job that it's not i'm not i'm i don't like i don't i don't care about spreadsheets and i don't like some of the things that i don't like it but you know if there's times that i hire someone to do there are things that i need to do myself I'm like oh i gotta do this here, which is part of it you know, do I love it? No, I would rather do be doing something else, or creating content, or doing something else. But there are parts of the the journey, parts of thing, the the job that needs to be done. That is not always the you know the the coolest one or whatever. But it needs to be done in order. Remember, as I mentioned about the the climb to the mountain, it's not going to be easy. That climb not supposed to be easy. If it was easy. Everyone would do it. Everyone would go after goals and dreams, but it, it's not. That's why it's a small percentage of people that have that emotional resilience to keep going. And I feel that jujitsu is an incredible tool to raise your emotional resilience. Thank you, Professor. And now I have one question that it comes: How uh, do I have the the consistency to continue climbing the mountain? If I can say in that way i feel that is from each one how meaningful is this mission what is your why because if you if you don't understand really or you need to keep the balance of when you have your your motivation let's say you have the intrinsic and the extrinsic motivation and you need to have a balance Many times people focus on the extrinsic motivation, which is important. The financial aspect is important, you know, or maybe some people focus on the recognition of fame or the followers and all that. But guess what? If you just focus on that, it's going to take you to one spot because when things get rough and will get rough, period, if, you, if you're really planning something big, at one point, if your why is not big enough, you're just going to crack and you're going to stop. Fact. It's a fact. You know, so you need to have the balance of the intrinsic motivation. Why I'm really doing this. I love this. But you need to have the extrinsic motivation too. Otherwise, if you're a business owner and you're just intrins intrinsic motivation and put peace and love and you're going to become a hippie. And, that means always, <laughs> and maybe your, your business is not going to thrive as much as you'd like to. But if that's what you want, that's okay. But I always say it's just... Uh, for example, I'm going <laughs> to, a quick example just came to my mind right now. So when I, uh, maybe 2000, my last job, it was about 2005, my last job that I did that I didn't want to was house cleaning. Mm -hmm. So I was, um, I was in a moment that I was teaching jujitsu, doing other jobs, but I wasn't doing well financially yet. And my son back then was already living in Brazil. So I didn't see him for about six months and when it got uh, that was maybe like deep, maybe july or something and i already noticed that man i will not have money to go to brazil in december 
I need to come up with something in it and I needed to find something flexible because I taught only back then it was only two classes, you just classes to teach. So I needed to fit something in between the classes in the afternoon or other times that I did. So I started to brainstorm and so, said, okay, I need, and that's what jujitsu helps you with problem solving. That's what jujitsu is about, problem solving. So I thought, well, I have a problem that I need to solve what I'm going to do. And I thought about house cleaning that's flexible. It's a decent money. So I got in contact with a friend of mine, one of my best friends still, and he worked with house cleaning, but he worked like three times a week because he wanted, you know, he didn't want to get overwhelmed with the work and he's very chill and that, that's fine. So I went to his house on, on a Friday and I was like, all right, show me, I saw research online, what I could find. And I just asked him like, okay, uh, what do you need? And then, so he was cleaning his house and kind of showing me like things that he does, you know, and stuff for cool. So the next month, the following Monday, so almost like 10 days after I got my first client. And then he said like, dude, how the hell do you already got a client? I've been trying to get clients all the time. And I was like, no, you're not. You want to work three times a week. So that's the good thing of having like, and we're still good friends, one of my best friends. And tell your friends like how it is. Because sometimes he'll, he'll be like, man, you know, like I'm broke. I'm like, stop. I don't want to hear. You know, you've been saying this for years. I tell you, you choose to work three times a week. So now get this. You don't have the right to complain. I have no sympathy for you at all. If you bust in your ass 10, 12 hours a day, and then I'm like, I feel you, man, stick with it. Go. Yeah. But now you're not committing to, to your own stuff. And then you want me to feel bad about for you? No. Like you put yourself in a situation because you want, you don't want, you don't want more clients, which means you don't need more money. So now it doesn't give you the right to complain. That is just my opinion. Not everyone needs to agree with what I'm saying, but just calling how I see it. So with that, I was able for six months to do house cleaning. And honestly, it was starting to take off. I could get to a point to hire someone to do it, but I'm like, this is not my passion. This is not something that I want to get to a point that is so big. I got something in my hand. I could, oh yeah, sell the business. I just, my heart just wasn't in that. It was just like, this is just to give me some money, which was great. I was able to get the money to go to Brazil. Uh, buy gifts for my family and then that was the last job I had you know that I that I had to buy that point jiu-jitsu that was around the time to that, that that ultimate fighter in mm. the first one that came in the United States and spy tv and that it was kind of like the boom in jiu-jitsu in the U.S. people start to like know more about UFC I was in an MMA gym People started asking more about what is jujitsu and then things start to get better. So there was a timing thing I got. So I got this transition to, I came to US in 99 when I had like two, two gyms in Las Vegas. That was it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was, I was lucky to kind of be part of this transition too. But the point is there was a, there was a problem. We need to solve that problem. And I knew my bigger why was to one day have, you know, an academy. So I just did what I had to do for that time. And if I wanted to, would I be able to say for many, many, many years doing the house cleaning, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, but there will be pure extrinsic motivation, no mm -hmm. intrinsic. So I need, I need to have that balance. If you want to have a successful, successful business that can last, even when you're gone, you play the infinite game, not the finite game that I'm going to do this and sell the company and, and be done. No, the infinite game that you're going to leave, I'm going to die, and the, the school is going to keep inspiring, impact, and improving lives, and my and the nonprofit organization is going to keep doing So everything I do is focused on that in an infinite game, that when I'm gone, you know, the show must continue. It's not like Gustavo die, wrap it up. No, the show must continue. Leave your legacy perfect, Professor. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. Uh, also in your podcast and you you told also a little before about the dark passenger for the listeners that don't know what is the dark passenger and i love the name can you describe a little bit more what is our dark passenger yeah i don't know if the the series uh, dexter uh it's famous in in europe or not but uh it's uh it's the negative voice that lives in your head that 
bring all the the fears, doubts, insecurities, and that basically is going to be that lives in your head with you. It's your roommate for life. You never get rid of it. You're like, oh no, I need to get rid of my negative thoughts. Good luck. You won't. You know, the, they say that I don't know about those stories, but that's just the numbers I hear that the human being has from fifty to sixty thousand thoughts a day. And guess what? Seventy to eighty percent of them are negative. We don't realize how often we criticize and judge not only others, but mainly our own selves. You know, of like, who do you think you are to accomplish this? Who makes you think that you can do this and that and that and that? And again, if you don't get in a scrap with your dark passenger, he's going to control it. You know, so either you learn how to control your mind or you let your mind control you. It's one or the other. It's your choice. And here's the thing. Uh, this, again, you're going to live with this roommate for the rest of your life. So you don't, you can't really, I used to say to control it, but it's not control. It's to become aware. Become aware that this voice is like, oh, the voice kicking in. Investigate the voice. Like, what exactly that is? Does it make any sense? check it and is exhausting because it's 24 seven. That's why uh, um, you need to work on this. I mean, the negative voice doesn't take a break. Maybe take a little break, you know, and cause here's the thing. It's funny when you have like, it's, it's one thing you have an idea like, you know what, I'm going to go to a restaurant, certain restaurant to eat. Cool idea. I'll go there tomorrow. There's no anxiety. Good. And then you have an idea of, I think I'm going to start a new business. Boom, that anxiety hits you and then the dark pastor wake up like, said what? You said you're going to open a business? Dude, who? Who do you think you are? And the whole thing. And then there's a book, The Five Second Rule, you know, by Mel Robbins, that talks about you got about five seconds until your dark pastor kicks in. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's basically how, how it is, man. You just got to become more conscious of the voice. So self-awareness is the number one pillar. If you're not aware the dark past is going to run uh, the, the pay, dictate the pace of your life. And it's, it's a fact. And I, I felt that uh, it did, it did for me. And in in, do I have it? Of course I do. Everyone has, no one has a free pass. I'll tell you what, there's some people that can handle that internal battle, internal battle better than others. This a fact, you know, that's why you have some of the different competitors and high performers people who can handle the internal battle because whether people realize or not every single person me you you who's listening right now everyone is fighting an internal battle that no one knows about it just you know and in order to win the external battle whatever that is if it's a tournament if it's a new gig for new it doesn't matter whatever that is to have better odds of winning this external battle you better win your internal battle or be always in the top. There are days that we lose internal battle. Fact. I'd love to say that I have perfect days. It's not, for me, at least it's not true. There are days that are harder that I, sometimes I analyze my day at the end of the day of like, how well was, how tough was the battle today? You know, and sometimes you, you there's a day that you lose. And now the most important thing when I do lose a battle that happens is I think it's something that people don't use as much as start to be to improve with this years ago of forgiving yourself. People are always talking about, oh, I gotta forgive others and stuff like to first you have to forgive yourself for the choices that you made. You know, I wish I knew better, I wish I've done better, but it is what it is. Because if not, you're gonna dwell on things and then your life is not gonna gonna move. So when I analyze my day. At the end of the day, I like to think about that, you know, like if there's something I'd be like, dude, I totally messed up or like, oh, wow. Yeah. So either I stay angry, have my pity party, or I say like, forgive myself the best way. And then, and have, is basically acceptance. Now we have a different, uh, when I say about acceptance, sometimes people will misunderstand and they think that they're like, oh, acceptance, that means forgive myself. Well, I didn't do anything today. I forgive myself tomorrow, I do it. It's up to you if you want to look at this way, but it's like, I'm really fighting and I wasn't, I wasn't aware, you know, at a certain moment and I lost this battle and then 
forgive myself. Let me just get back and focus. Boom, let's go. And it's going to be the last battle you're going to lose? Absolutely not. You know, we, we're going to lose uh, battles every day. You, know, you said 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day. Are you kidding me? You think you're going to be that invincible? You're going to win that many battles? Man, good for you. You're like a special monk or whatever. You know what I mean? But that's hard, dude. That's all day. Does, you know, and that battle, it doesn't end. You know what I mean? It's just keep fighting. And number one is just um, self-awareness, to be aware of the negative voice. And another pillar of emotional intelligence, which is social awareness, be aware of other people, dark passengers too, because other people have dark passengers and they're going to try to pass their insecurities to you. Now it's up to you to cut it, you know what I mean? It would be like, I like to say the block, and you know, the karate block, like, you know, <laughs> I defend with the block and be like, you know, because if not, man. And, and the thing is, from people that many times love you and care about you, but in their mind, they try to save you from hurting. No, don't do that. Don't go, don't change jobs because the outcome. You know, the outcome, if it's not like that, you're going to do all this work, I might lose this, I might lose that, and all this process for nothing, stay here. So that's their mentality. That's on them. You don't have to agree with it. It'd be like, cool, thank you. But no, thank you. I don't want to. And this is something that I guess comes a little bit from my personality. As I mentioned, since I was younger, I was able to uh, really focus on my freedom of choice of what I wanted to do. And my mom, it's like uh, with my wife, like my best friend, you know, she knows everything about my life. She's very wise. But, but when we're talking like 25 years ago, almost 30 years ago, she was in a different stage of her mind. And, and she learned from my grandparents who learned for the grand grandparents that this is how life goes. You know, you go, and you work and you go, you get a degree and you retire and, and in their mind, that's their perception of success. So understand that success is not one size fits all. You know, you gotta understand what does success mean to you? Is that money, fame? Okay, if that's you, I'm not saying you're wrong. Is that for you? Is that what you want? Cool. But success is not for, it's not the same for everyone. So I don't know how, but I had this, realization and I remember like it was today when I was I I decided I told my mom I'm pursuing jiu-jitsu and that's I was like 16 years old and then the family really thought it was like yeah 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 it's good good jiu-jitsu keep them away from trouble but they really didn't think that I was going to do that and when it was time for me to go to college I told her that I'm like okay I especially in Brazil for you to have an, a gym most of the gyms in Brazil, it's like, it's a gym and you have a jiu-jitsu program inside. Mm. It's rare for you to find like a building or a room that like you rent a place just for jiu-jitsu. It's rare for you to see that, right? So my perception of my teenage years are like, okay, I want to have an academy. My vision of academy was gym, not an academy, a fitness gym. Mm. With, that's the only thing that I really knew. And that's probably 99% of the places. And and I thought, well, I need to do physical education so I can work with this. You know, I can do uh, personal training. I can work with sports that I like. I'm still helping people. And she flipped out when I said I was doing, going to do physical education. She's like, you're not going to make any money. You're going to be a PE teacher. You're going to be starving. You're not going to be successful. And then I was like, who's talking about money? I'm not talking about money, you know. And then for in her mind, is like, uh, and this happens with so many people when you, especially if there's anyone young listening, or maybe you look back in their mind, she is helping me to become successful. And then are like, I don't know what's wrong with them. I'm telling me what to do. I'm older and do that. And I do this and I do that. And how come it's not doing? And then start banging head. Next thing you're like the rabble of the family. I don't know what's wrong with them. Why he doesn't listen to what I'm, you know what I mean? And I'd be like, dude, it's not what I want to do. What? And then she wanted me to go to business school. I'm like, because she was teaching that, getting involved with that. I'm like, all right, tell me what you're going to teach in class. And then she started telling me, I'm like, I have zero interest in learning that. <laughs> like, I'm going to be miserable for four years. I'm going to have a degree. I'm not going to use it. I'm going to keep doing. There's no point of doing that. So since I was able to get into a public school in Brazil, which is a little harder to, to get in, because you do an annual mm -hmm. test in Brazil to get into to the college. 
So I was able to, uh, I'm very blessed because she provided me with a good education throughout my, my school years. So that prepared me to get into a good college and I would study for free for four years. So she couldn't say anything. It's not like I paid for college. So she couldn't really say anything. And by the time I graduated, it was around the time that I was moving to the U.S. where so everything kind of clicked in. Perfect. And you talk a lot about success. And I want, what is for you, how you define success? Because yeah, for a lot of people, it's like you said, external money, fame, well, uh, two things. One that I see is to live in congruence with, with your values, live in congruence with what you believe. Because it's not about money you can have. I know people that move to Hawaii to be a surfer, and that's what they do. They live like, you know, very simple life, but they love it. They love it. They surf every day. They got a little job. They're like, I'm right. I just got to do a little good, but I can't surf every day. Man, that's success to me. You're doing what you want. You didn't want to be doing anything else. Sounds good to me. So it's not about, the, it's just what you believe, what you want to do, go for it, regardless if it's money or not. And, and I feel that in the other hand to John Wooden, incredible coach that talks about having that success is that uh, having that internal peace of knowing that you did the best you could with you know, everything you had. You know, so John Wooden has incredible books and he's one of the most successful coaches in the history of the United States. Uh, when they say they, he was voted once like the coach of the century and the guy in, in his books never talk about the word win. So it's very different. You know what I mean? He doesn't talk about winning. He talks about busting your ass working, like going through the process, working as hard as you can for, for your goal and doing what you practice in whatever the reality that is in, in sports. And then it's that all I want is you to practice, prepare yourself super hard and do your best to use everything you know. If you can do that and you leave like, man, I really try everything, but they did better. That's having that internal peace that you know that's a a form of success success in business everything i'm you consistently trying consistently trying knowing that every day you're doing the best you can with the tools and knowledge you have right now and that's the kind of like of course not always happened i mean he didn't win for many many years it took him i don't even remember how many years it took him to win a championship i don't know maybe when he started maybe seven eight years or something without anything and then he won 10 in 12 years you know, so with the same mindset. So it's really incredible. He died, I think he was maybe 99 or 100 or something. And very wise. And, and I feel, but answering your question, the main thing is, I think for me, success is just living congruence with what I believe. And mine is freedom of choice. So as long as I can do that, you know, I'm good. You know, uh, if there's a student that, maybe has an attitude at the school, um, I'm gonna fire the client. I'm gonna fire, no, you gotta go. I'm not gonna put up in anyone's shit because of uh, $150 or whatever that is. You know, be like, no, nope. I have my freedom to choose who I want to work with, what I wanna do, what I wanna travel. I don't have to, and again, that's something that you, there's a price to pay for if you wanna be an entrepreneur, becoming an entrepreneur. I don't know the audience, I don't know how many people have the, aspirations to be an entrepreneur it's not for everyone okay gary vaynerchuk i don't know if many, if you guys know gary v american digital uh, marketing expert i i picked up a lot of like really good concepts for him mm -hmm. and he said something that one of the probably one of the main concepts that i learned from him that he said some people have entrepreneurial tendencies and some people have entrepreneurial dna it's a different thing so when you have an entrepreneurial tendency, it's like, oh man, that would be pretty cool to have my own business. I have my own hours. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. And then they start doing it, it doesn't work. And they're like, yeah, this, it wasn't for me. I, I need to do something else. No problem, no, nothing wrong with that. You're learning about yourself. You understand that this is not, maybe it's not for me. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good to realize that. And, and you always say, there's nothing wrong with being the number two. Number two is really good too. 
You know, it doesn't have to mean that, doesn't mean that you, you run the show as your thing. It could be helping a company and could be the second. There's nothing wrong with that. But now when you have the entrepreneurial DNA, and I believe that, that I think I was blessed to have that, is that you do it, you break it, and it doesn't work, and you go out of business, and you try it again, and you try a different business, and then you break it, and then you try it, and you try again, because you don't know anything, I don't know anything else, I don't know anything different, you know what I mean, it's just like, I need to have, I need to run my show, I need to have my freedom, you know, so that's why for me, it's not an option, I, again, in different moments of my life, I had to, there's no option, I came here to the U.S. with exactly $2,700 in a tourist visa. You know what I mean? So me saying that I'm going to open my business, it's, it's an illusion, you know? So I feel that people understanding like where exactly if they are, if they want to get involved in entrepreneurship, they need to understand that to get to this point of all oh, the freedom, see all the videos, people doing this, doing that. But uh, that's exactly uh, the freedom that I want in a way if I want to travel, I don't have to say, oh, I can't travel. I only have two weeks of the year or a month that I can travel. Like, you're out of your mind. I prefer to make very, very little money, but have the freedom that I don't, I don't have to ask permission. Just like, yo, I'm out two weeks, done. I'm out three months. I go to Brazil, go for a month. I'm out, peace. You know, of course, it took a long time, a lot of lessons. And there's a price for you to, to pay to get to this point. However, if people want to play the entrepreneurship game, understand that it's a roller coaster. Right now, being an entrepreneur, man, a lot of a lot of business are closing. You know, it's not easy. Like, suddenly, you just close down your business for three months. We're like, dude, I'm gonna pay my bills. You know, so it's hard. So there's the the pros and cons, I guess, the entrepreneurship. But understanding if that's for you, I think it's uh, super important. Perfect, Professor. It is. And nowadays, I think you, you are this, they sell it. It sells the, the, the dream of the entrepreneur with the Lamborghini, the big house, but they don't say the grind behind that. You talk a lot about that in your podcast, and I think it's, it's true. It's not, it's okay, there is the beautiful part of it, but. How many years did you work for it? Yeah, I. And here's the thing too, a part of because I see some of the videos, you know, not judging, but when someone wants to have a badass ride and a mansion and all that, that's fine. That's that's each one perception of success. And at one point, and I felt that I, I was on that too. Like, oh, I want to have a nice lodge. Of course, I'm doing everything I'm doing, but like, I want to have a nice house. I want to have. And as I got older. I start to think more about it like like the house that say, this is my house. No, it's not your house. Are you going to take with you when you die? Then the coffin is going to be like, this is mine. This is not your house. And in, in, in years, other family is going to live there. You know what I mean? That's it. It's not your, you think it's your house, but it's not your house. You know, you came to the world with nothing and you leave with nothing. You know what I mean? Like you come, it's just naked. That's it. And then you're gone. You're gone. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing, nothing left. So sometimes, uh, so that over time, as I got older, um, I'm, I'll be 46 this year. Mm -hmm. I start to care less and less for money. You know what I mean? It's, it's just strange, but I just start to care less and just getting more involved with the things that I wanted with, especially with nonprofits and so forth. But I start to think more about it. Like, do I really need this badass ride in this and this big mansion in this boat? Really? And like, uh, again, not judging because people do whatever they want, but it's not a priority in my life. The material things, it became not like a, a, a priority. I live in a, a, a good house that I'm, it's plenty. It's just me and my wife and my son just moved to, uh, back to Brazil. I have plenty of room. I live fairly close to my academy. Uh, do I need a bigger house? Or like, why do I need a bigger house? To show people that I made tons of money? Does, does it really matter? You know, so I think it's just when you get older, you start to reevaluate. And then just look back and see like, wow, decisions that I made in the past because I had at some moment 
some moments in my life, maybe my perception of success was getting caught into what people expect of like, oh, if you have a, a badass car, that means you do really well financially. And if you have a mansion, you know, so again, that's, that's from each one's journey.